Uh, this is Greg Stone uh, with the New England Aquarium. Do we have uh, contact there? There we are. I love these guys. <laughs> well, I think the uh, the timing of these three talks was actually quite good. I I didn't actually I know Jim, but I didn't know the content of the previous talk. And uh, the way it was described to me was we were going from general to more specific, and that's certainly the case. Uh, I wanted to. Can you see that, or should we kill the, some lights up here? Yeah, it feels very bright. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Les. <laughs> uh, we, uh, I'm going to talk to you about a, uh, and this also relates to the previous panel in terms of how you convey important information, how you put a spine onto uh, important messages. In um, March of 2000, a very large iceberg broke off from the Ross Ice Shelf, and uh, we set out to explore this iceberg with the goals of exploring the largest iceberg in history, uh, and studying iceberg ecology, what are the effects of this iceberg on the surrounding ocean and the animals in that ocean, and uh, also to use this as a vehicle to talk about global impacts to the ocean uh, from global warming. And the story here is that the Ross Ice Shelf, which is essentially an extension of the Antarctic ice cap that flows out over the water, this in itself is a fascinating feature, actually. It's about the size of France and it's up to 2,000 feet thick. And it's basically a big glacier that's spread out and floats on the water. Uh, but in March of 2000, an iceberg called B-15 broke off from its leading edge, and many of you may have heard of it because it hit the news quite in a big way. Uh, broke off, and it was about the size of Connecticut. It was about 1,000 cubic miles of ice. And if it were melted and used, it would supply the United States for five years. It was a tremendous amount of ice. And as it broke off and started moving, it was really the largest moving object on the planet at that time, the largest relatively fast moving object. It soon after broke off into two fairly large chunks, B-15A and B-15B. B-15A spun around and, it's, and grounded here and is actually still grounded there. B-15B went out to sea into the Ross, into the Ross Sea, and we, that's the one we headed for. <clears throat> the outcomes of this were a National Geographic article that I wrote in December of 2001, uh, two television documentaries, uh, an expedition book coming out this next year, and a series of science papers that are, that are underway right now. Uh, we, we set out from uh, New Zealand to cross the uh, Southern Ocean in a, our expedition boat and went into the Ross Sea to, to encounter this iceberg. Uh, this was an unusual way to get to the Antarctic nowadays. Most people that go to this part of the Antarctic fly down but we needed a, an expedition vessel with us, so it took us about two weeks to get there. And that's the equivalent of traveling from Florida to Los Angeles at about nine miles an hour by, while being tossed around and whipped by gale force seas. <clears throat> Very rough, rough passage with things like icing conditions on the boat, which uh, occurs whenever the air temperature falls below the freezing point of the ocean. Uh, as the spray comes up, the, the seawater freezes on the vessel and in extreme conditions, it can actually turn the vessel over because the ice gets so heavy that it, dis it puts it out of balance. So it's very important to get that off. Also, there's very interesting interpersonal things that happen on boats. This is the cook who decided after about five days she didn't want to be on the trip. So uh, she actually started spreading rumors that there wasn't enough food, hoping that uh, that would cause us expedition leaders to turn the boat around. Of course, it didn't. But there's a whole interpersonal aspect to being on a, a small boat for two months it's uh, very interesting. We, of course, we did get to the Antarctic uh, and were there for two months with everything we needed, including this is all aviation fuel for the helicopter we had, 
and we set about studying uh, the ecology of icebergs in Antarctica, especially very, very large icebergs. Uh, I know probably many of you have been there, and you know that it's just a fabulous uh, part of the planet and one that is very good for storytelling as well as research. It's uh, the continental part of Antarctica is the size of the United States and Mexico combined. It's quite large, and if you look at a sort of a, a historical migration aspect of the planet, we colonized, and by colonization I mean we spread around the planet establishing year-round colonies of ourselves. <laughs> I mean, we are the ultimate exotic species, right? Uh, we basically established colonies throughout the planet, but we didn't get to Antarctica, a very large continent, until just this century. So we finally completed our colonization of the planet. We got to Antarctica as humans and uh, spend uh, year-round habitation there now. Uh, it contains 60% of the world's freshwater reserves. Again, that's surface water, uh, not necessarily groundwater. Uh, there's a really incredible feature in that there's this four-kilometer thick ice sheet that's uh, 500,000 years old in places. There's actually parts of it that have been discovered that are up to a million years old and beyond uh, in some of the lower uh, covered areas. Each year there's a tremendous freezing and thawing of the ocean around Antarct Antarctica, which when it's in its peak uh, freezing mode goes at 4.2 kilometers a day out. And then the annual cycle is 16 million kilometers of uh, seawater freeze and melt each year. Uh, we used uh, diving techniques to study the icebergs, and we were often uh, pushing ice out of the way to get into the water. And, but while, while underwater, we found uh, it to be a magical environment, and we found very unique ecosystems and habitats around these icebergs. Really, what our premise was that this was a very large iceberg. More icebergs, large icebergs are forming. What new kinds of ocean ecology, what new kinds of ocean impacts are happening around these icebergs? And we wanted to find out, so we had to get into the water. Studying the currents, studying the animals. This is Antarctic krill. The, one of the probably the most famous character from the ecosystem down there, and you can see that it's green here because the food chain is very short. The krill eats the phytoplankton, the photosynthetic uh, part of the food chain. It goes right into the krill, and the krill basically feeds everything else, which is why the ecosystem is so robust and so explosive during the uh, short Antarctic summer. We found by diving that we could collect and study uh, very delicate life forms like this meter-long siphonophore, which is an Antarctic variety that we found uh, was attracted to the edges of icebergs. We also studied uh, uh, some of the other pelagic invertebrates like this tenophore of Baroe, tenophore which uh, eats other jellyfish. And again, we found unique assemblages and, uh, and species compositions around the icebergs. <clears throat> But for me, most interestingly, we studied the water structure near these, and we found that when we got to big pieces of B-15, and by big, uh, by the time we got there, there was the one big one, B-15B, which was about 40, 50 miles long and 25 miles wide, but there were lots of other chunks that were 10, 15 miles long and four, six, five miles wide. These are big tabular bergs that they were melting uh, in the Antarctic Ocean and we, this is a CTD which, which uh, collects uh, information on salinity, temperature, and depth. And we found that there were big freshwater wedges around these icebergs that went down 100 feet and out sometimes a quarter of a mile. And uh, these are the kind of icebergs we were studying. They would just go on forever as far as the eye could see, and they'd extend down underwater um, for up to uh, 1,000, 1,500 feet. So we actually found uh, juvenile stages of ice fish living in fresh water, which had never been found before uh, because of this, this uh, massive melting that was going on around these icebergs. And near the end of the trip, we also uh, went over to the mainland. We spent most of our time out in the middle of the Ross Sea, but we went to a place called Cape Hallett and studied this iceberg, and it was grounded, and we did quite a series of dives around it. But phenomenally, the last day that we were there uh, at midnight, Half of the iceberg uh, broke away, and it broke away right down this crevasse there. And then within a space of about two minutes, it disintegrated. Uh, and it was an iceberg about the size of six city blocks that just suddenly upended, rocked and rolled, and then the 
immediately there was about a two or three square mile patch of the ocean that was covered in the fractured ice, which was the largest piece was about the size of a, uh, a Volkswagen. Now, this is important because the instantaneous dis disintegration of ice shelves is happening more and more in the Antarctic, especially on the other side, the Antarctic Peninsula. And some of you may have read about the Larsen B ice shelf last year, which instantaneously came apart, but no one witnessed it. It's usually what happens is you see a satellite picture one day or a boat goes by one week and returns the next week or the satellite comes back and looks at it. I, I've found very few people, I actually haven't found anybody that's seen one come apart as we did, and it was a very dramatic, uh, very dramatic moment. The iceberg itself was about five years old, so we felt like it was almost a lottery ticket chance that we happened to be there the moment that uh, it went through this catastrophic destruction. Um, again, we, we used our journey uh, as a, a backbone to talk about uh, these issues, and they're in the National Geographic article, they're in the book, they're in the TV documentaries. We're publishing our results on the new biologies around the icebergs, but we find the public is very open to these sort of big events, these planetary events that we can then use to get their attention and then we can get information to them. Uh, the polar regions, as our planet hurtles through space, are very sensitive to climate change. You basically, if you want to find change, you want to go to the hottest and the coldest areas because they're already kind of on the edge of stability. Um, there's a positive uh, feedback loop with ice at the poles. What I mean by that is as, you, as the ice melts, there's less white area on the poles, so there's less reflection of sunlight and energy back into space there's more absorption of energy into the planet and things tend to get warmer. So the less ice there is, the, the, it's called the albedo effect, the more energy, hence the more heat the Earth absorbs and the warmer it, it may get. There are ice shelves breaking apart in the Antarctic uh, at higher rates and we're getting more uh, big icebergs floating around creating these new conditions. There have been some uh, very important studies and knowing how you're all edgy journalists with uh, uh, well read in this, in this topic are probably aware of the definitive studies that have shown decreased krill populations related to decreased uh, ice cover in the Antarctic Peninsula area, which has in turn impacted uh, penguin populations adversely. So we're already finding the ecological trail, the ecological mystery story being solved for some climate change issues in Antarctica. And one topic that uh, I found the previous talk really fascinating uh, is that the Antarctic, the, the coldness of the Antarctic actually feeds the global conveyor belt of ocean currents and has impacts throughout the planet. The Antarctic uh, chills water, it sinks, and then it travels around the planet uh, creating and impacting uh, climate throughout the planet. If the Antarctic were to warm up too much, that conveyor belt of ocean currents could be altered arrested, changed, and we could have very rapid uh, climate change on the planet. And the warming of the deep water, 700 to 1,100 meters, I think is a, a very important clue about the possibility of changes in the ocean currents. Um, this is the, people are often interested to see the individuals that partake in these things. Sponsors were the Bermuda Underwater Exploration Institute, the New England Aquarium, the National Geographic Society, and there's a web page, iceisland.net. Oh, Ice Thank you.